Well, welcome again to worship. Happy Mother's Day again. Um, I, since it's Mother's Day, I'm going to take, and I, I'm up here, and I have a microphone and, and authority over a big screen. I'm going to show you some pictures. The first is a picture of my mom, and uh, 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 that's my mom. Briefly, that was, oh, there she is. She disappeared. There we go. And, and my, mom, my mom clearly loves to vote. Uh, and, and, but my mom is not the only mom in my life. Her mom, which we called Ma, in fact, everybody called Ma, um, even people that weren't related to Ma, and this was taken a number of years ago. That's my mom and her siblings there. And sadly, I think I'm older now than my mom was when that picture was taken. And I always thought my mom was really pretty old. Uh, so, you know. And then there's my dad's mom, whom we called, uh, we called Mamaw, and uh, that's my dad's mom, Mamaw, and, um, and my dad and his sister there. Uh, so, I, and then, so those are kind of the biological moms in my life. Of course, I have great-grandmothers going way back, too, but I uh, wanted to show those pictures today. And I also wanted to mention one of the most important, in fact, I think, you know, apart from my mom herself, the most important spiritual mom that I have, and I don't have a picture of her, but uh, one of my um, first pastors was a woman by the name of Marcia Rummel. And uh, she was appointed to our little church in southeastern Ohio. Um, it was her first appointment fresh out of seminary. And, um, and we were an uber-conservative rural church in southern Appalachia in Ohio. And uh, it was a tough appointment for Marcia. And she had, the, more, the older I get and the more I think about my theology and the influences on my life and the pastor and person I am today, the more I realize just how much influence Marcia had in all of that. And I am so grateful for her. Uh, and uh, she's retired now. Um, and uh, I, I need to find her and, and give her a big hug when I can here. So, uh, but, uh, but those are the moms in my life. And today's Mother's Day. And, and you might be wondering, what in the world that pastor passage that David read has to do with Mother's Day. We're going to get to that. It's going to take a while, but we're going to get to that. Kind of the, the key verse in this, if, if, um, if this message were from McDonald's, the Big Mac of the message is this verse, turning toward the dead woman, he, that is Jesus, said, Tabitha, get up. She opened up her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. A woman is raised to life after she died. It's extraordinary. They didn't, they didn't even send for Peter until after she died. I, I find that stunning. We're not going to really talk about that much. Just want to mention that. But that's kind of the Big Mac. But, but anyone in my generation knows there's layers to a Big Mac, right? right? If you know it, say it along with me. Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. All of you younger folks out here now have living proof that people in my generation are just weird. Um, but, you know, when I eat the Big Mac, I can't taste all of those things individually, but they're there. In this sense, a Big Mac is like a fine wine. Sure. Yes, thank you. Thank you. If you're a wine drinker, which I'm not, not because I think wine's evil, but when I drink a glass of wine, I just think, oh, someone left the grape juice out too long. Um, but you know, you could read description, hints of bouquet of roses and floral accents and hints of mead and honey and you know, all of these, and all of that's lost on me. But someone that really knows wine can discern all of those layers. Music is the same kind of thing, particularly kinds of, I love listening to music, but when I'm listening to music, I can't pick out the bass track. I can't tell what, I, like, I know there's a guitar going there, but I don't really know what they're doing, and the keyboards are in there. Music to me, when I tried to play guitar, learn to play guitar once, oh, it was awful. Um, it's like everything, I just, was the melody, was the whole song, and I was like, it doesn't sound the same. And, and there were a lot of reasons for that, but part of it is, and there are certain kinds, like, like and this is not a disparaging statement against heavy metal music, but when I hear heavy metal music, all I hear is sound. I can't hear the layers and the highly technical kinds of things that are going on that someone that really loves and understands that genre of music can hear. There are layers to it that, that a hack like me, I just can't pick out. This story is like that. You know, the Big Mac of this story is that verse. Turning toward the dead woman, Peter said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. A dead woman was raised back to life, not by Jesus himself, but by one of Jesus' apostles. That's the Big Mac. We're going to peel back the layers. 
and, and really see the depth and the hints and the notes and the subtleties of this story. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, and it was really a two, part, two parts of a, of a single writing, is an exceptionally skilled author. He wasn't just someone out there repeating things that he heard. He got a lot of his material from other sources. Um, he was himself not an eyewitness to most of the things that he wrote about. But, but he very skillfully and deftly and efficiently put these stories together in a way that, that has a lot of meaning that we don't get to if we don't really kind of settle into the subtle hints and notes and layers here. So that's what we're going to do here today with this passage. And by the time we get to the end, you're going to say, oh, that's what it has to do with Mother's Day, all right? So, but let's, let's take a moment and, and look at the context is kind of the first layer here. And Acts chapter 9, verse 36 says this, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. The first part of the context we're looking at here today is just that first phrase, in Joppa. Now, that's not Joppa. That's a, a Google Maps image of modern-day Israel. The city of Jerusalem is still in the same place as it was then. And that little red mark is Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was crucified. That's where the resurrection happened. That's when Jesus beget, prophetically says to his disciples, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes on you, and when you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's a geographical outwardness to the progression of the gospel and the growth of the people set apart for God, set apart by God, which we call the church. And it started in Jerusalem. The, Peter was not original. This, this is events of this story took place in, in, in you know, Lida, Lida, Luda, uh, today and in many other writings in ancient times, it was just called Lod or Lud or Lud. Um, that's not, that's where it is. But before Peter got there, I'm sorry, he was in Joppa. Before Peter got there, he was in Lida. And, and that's where Lida is today in relationship to Jerusalem and where it was in Peter's day in relationship to Jerusalem. So he was traveling away from Jerusalem toward the Mediterranean coast. And, and it wasn't a geographically long journey, but it was that movement out. There was this outward progression. And while he was there, Tabitha, known in Greek as Dorcas, died in the city of Joppa, which is still exists. By the way, just by the way, as we think about old things, uh, of which I am not yet one, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we celebrate things in the U.S. that we think are like really, really old. You know, I've been in church buildings. We, well, this church building is so old, we must preserve the building. <laughs> I was, did a little study in, in, in Lida. There are remains from 5200 B.C. <laughs> it's, it's over 7,000-year-old uh, civilization time in that area. We don't really know what old is in 21st century America and in, in this area anyway. So, but that's neither here nor there. So traveling then from Lida to Joppa, which is a, a suburb of Tel Aviv now and was just outside of Tel Aviv then, a major port city, the primary port city for the nation of Israel then, and I think also now. Um, that's where these events took place. And then, and, and this is where, where Peter, again, raises Tabitha, also called Dorcas in Greek. And from there, Peter goes to Caesarea, which is up the coast. There's, do you see what's happening here? And it's in Caesarea that Peter goes into the home of Cornelius, the centurion, the Roman, not even Jewish at all, and shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there, the, part of the context that, that Luke is getting us to see here and showing us, if we get into the layers, is this is that geographic outward progression of the gospel that Jesus prophesied. And Peter's not going out and planting churches. These churches are already there. The gospel's already spread out. Now this particular apostle is going out to support, encourage, bear witness, teach, preach, those kinds of things. It's that geographic progression. The community of Jesus' followers, set apart by God, the church, was growing and moving geographically outward from Jerusalem. That's the next slide, I think. Yeah, geographically outward from Jerusalem. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is this. Next verse. In Joppa, there was a... That's the same verse, just the next slide. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. 
And I'm going to read another verse from the passage. going to jump around a little bit. Peter went with him, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. And then turning to the dead woman, Peter said, Tabitha, get up. What's going on here? First of all, Tabitha is an Aramaic name, and it means deer or gazelle. Dorcas is a Greek name that means deer or gazelle. And, and so this was her name, you know, it wasn't like we do in English today where we just take whatever your name is in any language and try to say it in English and that's your name. They took the meaning of her name in Aramaic and, and, and the folks that were Greek speaking that were different ethnically called her Dorcas. Why are we getting all of this? Why is this here? And it's not, I mean, if it was just, okay, we've got people from different backgrounds, Aramaic background, Hebrew background, Greek background, so we've got to make sure that everyone knows that if you've heard this story or you've heard it about Tabitha or you've heard it about Dorcas, they're really the same person. I don't think that's what's happening. Because all we would have needed to do that was that first Tabitha, in Greek her name is Dorcas. But we get her called Tabitha at the beginning with the translation of her name into Greek. And then at the end, when Peter addresses her, he calls her Tabitha. Peter is Jewish. Peter is, is a, a native Aramaic speaker. And he calls her Tabitha. But the people in the middle, the folks that were so grieved at losing Tabitha, didn't call her Tabitha. They called her Dorcas. I think what Luke is getting at here and what he's showing us subtly is that, that this was multi-ethnic ministry that Tabitha was doing. That this community of Jesus followers set, about, set apart by God, the church was increasingly multi-ethnic. Tabitha, Tabitha was at the very least doing ministry with people who were ethnically different from her. And doing that ministry so effectively and so loving, and they weren't a project, they were people whom she loved that they called her by her Greek name, where Peter called her by her Aramaic name, and it was all the same. It was all the same. What's happening? The community of Jesus followers, set apart by God, the church was increasingly multi-ethnic. That's one other part of the layer. Another part of the context here in the next set of verses. Um, I'm going to read again a whole collection of verses from Acts chapter 9. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Then turning to the dead woman, again, this things happened in between, Peter said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. Peter, seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helping her to her feet. Then he called for those set apart, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Part of the context of this story is that the community of Jesus' followers, set apart by God, the church, was revealing the love and power of the living Jesus. It's significant here that even though Peter, in both instances, is the conduit for the miracle, no one put their faith in Peter. Did you notice that? Peter, when Jesus went into a place and healed and raised people from the dead, which he did, and now his apostles were doing, when Jesus did it, people put their faith in Jesus. When Peter's doing it, people are still putting their faith in Jesus. They are recognizing that the power is not Peter's power. That Peter is a conduit, an agent, a channel for the power that comes from the living Lord, Jesus Christ. And this, the followers of Jesus have this, power, have this power of Jesus in them in such a way that the people around them are recognizing in them not just Peter, but Jesus. The loving Lord and the power of our Jesus, oh, revealing the love and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. One more verse here for the moment. Then the church throughout Judea and Gal uh, yeah, then the, this, is, this is going back a little bit further. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace, and it was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. 
Aeneas, Peter said, and again, I'm going to swim to this, we've read already. Peter said, Jesus Christ heals you, get up, roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived and lied and shared and saw him and turned to the Lord. And then turning to the dead woman, Peter said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He looked, took her by the hand, helped her to her feet, and then called to the book, and then called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord, the community of Jesus followers. Set apart by God, the church was seeing many people come to have faith in Jesus. This is the context we have, a geographic outward movement, an ethnically diverse movement in which the power of Jesus is revealed and through those revelations, many are coming to put their faith in the Lord, coming to faith in Jesus. And in the midst of all of this context, we get this beautiful story about Tabitha, whose name in Greek is Dorcas. Let's go back to Tabitha for just a second, and we're going to get another layer in our Big Mac here. In verse 9, we've seen this verse twice, three times already. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Now, we're going to look at a number of different things here. One is we don't see it in this translation. Some of the translations do it. Most of them do not. In Greek, where it says, where we have in English, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, it's actually in Joppa, there was a woman disciple named Tabitha. I believe it's the only place in the New Testament where that term is used. A woman disciple. And in Luke's going out of his way here. Again, this is part of the diversity, too, that this is a woman we're talking about. This is a woman. Jesus honors a woman in the middle of this story, giving her her life back. Jesus honors a woman not as a mother, not as a daughter or a wife, not because of a relationship that she has to some man that's significant, not as a support role for a male in her life, but he honors her as a faithful hearer of God's word in her own right. Faithful hearer of God's word. How do we know that? Why? Because she was doing good for the poor all the time. She was full of good works. These were the things that the Scripture had taught that followers of God ought to be doing. Doing full of good works, generous in their good deeds, caring for the poor around them. And, and Tabitha didn't just hear that when she was taught about God and taught about the Scripture and taught about the history of her people. She couldn't just quote the Scripture. In fact, we don't even know if she could quote the Scripture. But what we know is that she heard the Word of God and she put it into practice. That's what faith is, by the way. Faith is not believing in our heads that something is real. Faith is acting on what we believe, putting our faith in. Without action, there is no faith. There might be belief in English, but there's no faith in Greek. The Greek word is based on the word pistis. Some places in the New Testament it gets translated as belief. Some places as, as faith. It does us a disservice because belief and faith are two different things in English. In Greek, it was all faith. And faith is obediently hearing the word of God. Hearing what God says and putting it into practice. And that's how Tabitha was honored. Jesus honors a woman. Jesus honors a powerful woman. Tabitha is just as full of power, the love and grace and power of Jesus Christ as Peter is. When Tabitha died, the people around her were like, no, we can't lose. She's, she's, she's pouring so much love into this community, so much love into the people around her. They were distraught. They were heartbroken. They were grieved. They were just, just devastated in their loss. And it wasn't just that she was a nice woman. It was the power of God flowing through her. She was faithfully following the word of God. The word and the power and the love of Jesus Christ were flowing outward from her into the lives of others. She was a woman full of power. Jesus honors a powerful woman. And Jesus honors a powerful woman who is an integral part of the community of the faithful in Joppa. Here is a woman who is a key person in the community, 
Her death didn't just affect her family. It didn't just affect a few people close to her. It didn't just affect significant relationships, biological relationships or, or legal relationships. Her death affected the, all the people around her, the community. Apart from bearing children, apart from being a wife, apart from being a daughter, she was a powerful woman, an integral part of the community. And Jesus honored her. Jesus honored her by giving her her life back. So, at this point, you got to ask, what does this have to do with Mother's Day? If you're making such a big deal, Blevins, about the fact that she's not a mom, or if she is a mom, we're not even told that, what does this have to do with Mother's Day? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked because this is Mother's Day. Let's jump back to the first part of Luke's writings the gospel of luke what we call the gospel of luke in chapter 9 verses 19 to 21 jesus is doing out doing some teaching and some preaching big crowds gathered in his mom and his brothers come to see him and this is what happens now jesus's mothers and brother mother and brothers came to see him but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd someone told him your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you and jesus replied my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Now, if you've grown up in a, or been part of long in any church like I have been, you've heard a lot about how this, you know, the brothers part of this. Some of the gospels say brothers and sisters. Luke, again, very efficient. It was just mother and brothers that came, and, Luke, and Jesus here in, in Luke's gospel only says mother and brothers. And, and because uh, the, the church in the West has been so male-dominated for so long, we have grown comfortable saying to women, well, you know, you're, you, you, you count too. You just have to think of yourself as a brother. Okay, fair enough in this context. But then I've got to say to everyone, including the men, we need to think of ourselves as a mother. My mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. We're going to forget the brothers part. We've had lots of sermons about the brothers. Let's talk about what does it mean to be a mother of Jesus. What does it mean to say that someone is a mother of Jesus? First of all, it means simply Jesus is saying, you're part of my family. You're part of my family. You belong. You belong with me. But there's another part of being a mother of Jesus, and that's capacity because that's a specific term a mother has a capacity that that others don't have and in fact has has fulfilled that capacity at least once once and that is bringing life into the world so we have the capacity as a mother of jesus we got the capacity to birth jesus into the lives of others isn't that what tabitha in Greek, whose name was Dorcas, was doing, birthing Jesus into the lives of... These folks knew who Jesus was long before Peter got there. Tabitha was doing this ministry, birthing Jesus into the life of others long before Jesus got there. And what else do mothers do? They nurture and they guide the growth of Jesus' identity and spirit in others, just like a biological mom or an adoptive mom or a community mom nurtures and guides people around her, children around her, as they grow into the identity God has for them. And they launch them out as mature followers of Jesus. The capacity of a mother... Jesus said, if you hear God's word and put it into practice, you are my mother. You are my mother. Another part of this business of Jesus being Jesus' mother is not just capacity, it's flow of responsibility. And be warned, it's not what you think. Because for us, we, we think so much of the flow of responsibility from the mother to the child that caring and guiding and nurturing and supporting and launching. But Jesus was an adult when he said these words. He was talking about the flow of responsibility of a son toward his mother. See, in our culture, we, it, we have things, our culture has gotten things so good, bad, or ugly. 
We have turned things around completely from Jesus' culture in so many different ways. And in, in, in our culture, it is so common to hear parents, men and women alike, saying things like, when I get old, I don't want to be a burden on my children. I want to be financially sustainable, so I'm not a burden on my children. That was the point of children in Jesus' day. I took care of you when you were, I wiped your butt and I wiped your nose and I put clothing on you and food in your mouth. Now I'm old, you got to do those things for me. I gave you a place to live, now you give me a place to live. I took care of you, now you take care of me. Adult children, particularly the firstborn son, had a responsibility to provide for their parents and particularly their mother if their father was no longer in the picture. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying to the women and men not only, who not only hear God's word and put it into practice that he will honor you as his own mother. Do you hear that? He will honor you as his own mother. Jesus honored his mother when he was on the cross he was dying, tortured, humiliated, ravaged, betrayed, abandoned by almost everyone except his mom who was there and a couple of other women and the disciple John. And he looked at John and he said, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Jesus, when he was dying, was making sure that there was a physical, present human being who would care for his mother after he died. Jesus is saying, I will honor you as I honor my mother. How did Jesus, and here's, here's Tabitha, faithfully hearing the word of God, hearing God's word and putting it into practice, and she died, and what does Jesus do? He raises her back to life. He sends people running from one city to another to get another dude who will run from that city back to his mom who has just died and pray for her and raise her back and give her her life back. That's how Jesus honored her with new life. This woman who was geographically distant, ethnically diverse, and, and, and a woman as a human being in her own right, apart from relationships. And because Jesus honored his mother this way in Joppa, we know that he will honor us as we faithfully hear God's word. You can know that Jesus will honor you as you faithfully hear God's word, as you hear God's word and put it into practice. Now, are you saying, Pastor, does that mean if I die, Jesus is going to raise me back to life? Yes! That's the point of all of it. What Jesus did for Tabitha is not unusual. Unusual only in the sense that it's already happened. But Jesus said, my resurrection, I'm just the first fruits. I'm just the beginning. Tabitha is one of those who followed after everyone else, too, who hear God's word and puts it into practice. And Jesus will raise to new life. So here's the message. The message is simple today. It's like a Big Mac. It's simple. You can put it in a styrofoam box. They don't use styrofoam anymore paper box. I'm old. I remember the styrofoam boxes. That was a big controversy back in the day. Here's the message with all of these layers underneath it. If Jesus honors his mothers in this way, how can we not honor our mothers? Not just on Mother's Day, but every day. Jesus said, follow me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And if the one we're following honors his mothers in this way, how can we do any less? How can we, how can we not breathe life into our mother's physical, spiritual, adoptive community? How can we not support and encourage and lift them up? How can we not breathe into them the hope of new life? How can we not provide for their physical needs, 
for their emotional needs, for their relational needs, for their spiritual needs. If we are hearing God's Word, how can we not put it into practice and honor our mothers as Jesus honored His? In Jesus' name, amen.